Please stand for the reading of the scripture. I will be reading from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 30. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together and the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Thank you, Claudia, for a beautiful prayer and leadership. And the choir is always, always good. Just a good place to be. I hope you uh, noticed the, the, the front of the bulletin. Did you, if you noticed that picture that I, that I created, that picture, actually, uh, that was actually taken of me the year I got here. <laughs> and Look what you guys have done to me. <laughs> Oh, anyway, it's good, good to laugh. I was, uh, I was watching a movie. I, it's probably been maybe six months ago. I, it was, it was staged in New York, and and, and the, the the lady went to open the door, and and there was like five locks on that door. Have you ever seen those? That just one, two, three dead bolts and locks, and she had to go all the way down that. It was sure to see that. Uh, we don't do that many locks around our houses. We sometimes we have two. If you're going to break in that door, it would have taken a battering ram two or three times to get through that door. But in spite of all those locks on that door, there was actually a note that had been slipped under that. Turned out to be kind of a valentine or a, a love note. Easter is a valentine that God slips under the door of our locked world. Easter is, represents that valentine. No matter how hard we try to live God's power and, purpose and promise in our lives, we all fall short of the best that God has for us. Can we say amen to that? We all fall short of that which God has for us. Persistently and gracefully, God comes to us and loves us anyway. Aren't you glad that God knows you and still loves you? Aren't you glad? John's account of Jesus' appearance begins with the disciples behind closed doors. They were trembling, hunkered down, grieving. No doubt pouting somewhat, running away from the perceptions of what they had experienced on Easter morning. And the text made clear that the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. And I, I can't help but wonder what were they really afraid of. Were they afraid of the disciples that were the disciples afraid of death? Or were they afraid of this new life that resurrection that re resurrection represented? You know, it's scary sometimes. I think, about, I think about the time Jesus asked the man that was laying, uh, laying crippled, he said, do you want to be healed? I thought for a minute, I, that, first of all, it sounded like a stupid question. Jesus asked this guy a stupid question. Do you want to be healed? But in reality, in our world, sometimes 
That's not as stupid a question as you might think it is. Because a new life, that represents, if that man was no longer, you know, if you're crippled or you can't do for yourself, that represents, that re represents something, a complete change in your world when, when all at once now you can do for yourself. Were these disciples afraid of the new life that resurrection represented? Now John makes it clear that Jesus just appeared. Just appeared. He didn't bother to pull back the door. He didn't go down painstakingly and, and unlock and unravel and undo all the chains and locks on those doors. Instead, he just appears. Whatever the resurrection of the body means, Jesus just appeared in a locked room. There's plenty of debates about what the resurrection of the body means, but we know for sure that the resurrection was the resur recognizable power that had happened in front of these disciples. It meant the recognizable love of Jesus. It, me it meant the recognizable essence of who Jesus was. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as well as in the book of Acts, we're told that the ascension of Jesus happened 40 days after Easter followed by 10, ten days, followed with Pentecost. But here in John, Easter and the Ascension and the Pentecost, it happened all at one time. The breath of Jesus is breathed collectively upon these disciples. Why? So that as a community, the community of faith, the community that we represent might become the risen body of Christ. The resurrection of Jesus is the, for the purpose of new creation, recreation, recreation after death and recreation before death. I always love the image of when I knelt one day at an old altar, I believe the blood fell, and when I raised up from that, a new person, a new creature created in the image of Jesus. Born again of the Spirit of God. That's what this whole resurrection passage represents. The ability to see the world not as it is, but as it could be under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. To begin to see people that are lost and wayward, and not as the problem, but as the mission that we've been called to reach, and to be, be called to minister to, be called to reach out to in love and concern and service. It's about the creation of the Christian church, so, so that through the power and ministry of our lives together, we might become a God's continuing presence from the day of the resurrection. We might continue that presence that we might proclaim to the world that our resurrection through the power of Jesus in the world. And verse 22, and with that he breathed on them, breathed on them, to receive the Holy Spirit. This wonderful picture of Jesus breathing on his disciples is a reminder, of course, of the Genesis story. First thing come to my mind is the Genesis story where God breathes life into Adam. And the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And then you have that wonderful vision in the book of Ezekiel where the dry bones come alive. God calls breath to enter the dry bones that Israel might live. Breath animates the bones. They rattle and clang and begin to dance and they begin to rise up coming together. Covered with flesh and sinew and muscle becoming a resurrected community of God's Hopeful people. Don't you see, church, that represents us. We who were lost and dead in our trespasses and sins, and God breathed the life into our bodies. He breathed into our spirit, and we become an everlasting, eternal being that's, that, that's walking with Jesus today and forevermore. I don't, man, that's, hey, that's good news. Are we yet alive, church? I'm going to wake you people up before I leave here this morning. I'm going to receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. See, I, I can still say that. Jesus says to us, locked here in our doubts, in our fears, in our faint-heartedness, when, when we're facing, God only knows what kind of obstacles that we're facing 
in our, in our personal lives, with, with ourselves, maybe with our family, with our world, with what's going on around us in our own community. Receive the power of life. Receive the gift of grace, the spirit of friendship, the spirit of discipleship. And Jesus says, so that you can become and go and be co-creators with me in God's world. You see what a gift? But with that gift comes great responsibility. As we read in the book of Acts, resurrection is experienced most powerfully in the community. And it describes for us what the early communities felt like and what they looked like. A community of celebration, a community of thanksgiving, where the poor, the widow, the immigrant, the alienated, the excluded, joined together with all of the privileged of society who had followed Jesus' teaching and, begun, and become changed, recreated, rebirthed in the image of the resurrected Christ. Jesus was the firstborn among many brethren, the Bible says. That means when it, when it implies that there was a second and a third and a fourth all the way down to whatever your number was when you received Jesus as your Lord. They lived together, engaging in teaching, in fellowship, in worship, in praise, acts of caring, mutual love for each other, affection uh, that, that intertwined throughout their lives, willingly and enthusiastically to embody the resurrection. Church, that's what we're called to be. There's tremendous responsibility in being called to take that message to the world. And the scriptures witnessed that day by day, they added to their number. Is this how the Christian church right here is reacting to this astounding, astounding, amazing grace of Easter? More than anything else, the concrete, practical result of Jesus' resurrection was a new ethic, a new way of life, a new way to see the world. Ann Dillard, who wrote, I've had a couple of her poems I've used in funerals, but one of her, one of her writings, she talks about teaching a stone to talk. It's madness. This is her words. It's madness to wear ladies' hats and straws. I don't believe I saw a hat this Easter. Do y'all remember the days when we used to wear hats and gloves and you got that new Easter frock on, you got that Easter dress? Many times that's the whole time you got a new, a new clothes was around Easter. Do y'all remember that? And women would wear hats with blackberries in it and everything else and all kinds of these fancy hats and had them little, had those little, uh, look like a menacing over top of their... Do y'all remember that? Some of y'all got some in them closets somewhere, ain't you? I bet you do. But in her words, she said, it's madness to wear lady straw hats and velvet hats to church. She said, we should be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should tie us to our pews for a sleeping God may wake someday. And take offense at our timid faith. Or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. The Dutch word for resurrection is opstanding. O-P, op, standing. Opstanding, which literally means to stand up, to take a stand, to be religious, to be pious, to be holy. At least within a Christian context, it does not mean to withdraw into a private world of feel-good faith. I think we've all been guilty of that at some level. Amen or ouch. Ouch. I think we've all been guilty. It means to stand up to the powers of the world, the principalities of the world that bring death to our people. Our neighbors are hurting. We have neighbors and family members that are lost and hurting as I speak right now. Our faith should be strong and bold, not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is in us. Amen. I heard Aiden say amen. <laughs> to means take a stand for the poor, the powerless, to take a stand against the pain and the possessiveness and the pride 
to take a stand to crush our self-serving ego that is so hard to die. My ego is hard to crush. Anybody else got a hard ego to crush? Man, you guys got a big ego. You won't even admit it. <laughs> to be part of the resurrected community means to be for life, not just against death. It means to be for life. There's an old story of a monk whose desire and ambition was make a pilgrimage to the Holy Sepulchre. He was going to walk around it three times. He was going to kneel and pray and return home a better person. And through the years, it took him years to save the money. He begged, before, he, uh, before his life ended, he wanted this opportunity. And at the end, he finally had enough money. At that time, it was about 30 pounds, which he would, he would take with him, and that was enough money to get him to his dream and to get back. And no sooner did he open the gates of the monastery to exit the monastery, he met a beggar bent over to the ground. He was picking herbs. When asked where he was going, he said, I'm going to the Holy Sepulchre. By God's grace, I'll go and walk around the sepulchre three times. By God's grace, I will kneel and pray. By God's grace, I will come back from that place a better man. The beggar looked at him with longing in his eyes. He said, give me the 30 pounds for my hungry family. Walk around me three times and kneel and pray and return to your monastery. The monk paused. He scratched the ground with his staff. He looked into his heart as he reached the beggar, his 30 pounds. He walked around the beggar three times. He knelt and prayed and returned to the monastery, a new and better person. For he had seen in the beggar the wounds of Jesus right there in the monastery. For he had seen in the beggar what Jesus had given him as Easter people. As Easter people, we can have a choice. Now we can walk around the empty tomb and we can pray and sing. Thank God for the gift of life that's been given to us, to me, to myself, to I. Or we can go from this place seeking the resurrected Christ in the wounds of the world. We can go from this place standing up, upstanding, standing up to the powers and principalities that bring death to this world. We can go from this place using the resurrection power that has been breathed into you, into this community. You can go from this place thankfully and passionately thanking God, bringing new life into a fragile world. What will our choice be? May it be life-giving for you. May, be, may it be life-giving for others. I bring you glad tidings of great joy this morning. The resurrected Christ offers eternal life, both after death, but as important before death. He offers us life today. The resurrected Christ gives us new life. He, 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 builds, he builds our body of strength and power by his holy presence in our lives that we may reject the evil of this world and know God's grace and mercy. That's some sweet news, church. Let's bow our heads. Father, in Jesus' name, you know the intent of all of our hearts. You know the struggles that are going on in folks' lives right now. I just pray, Father, that you intercede in every situation with your power. Empower and embold our people, God, to upstand, to stand up against the powers of evil that's destroying our world. Father, to upstand to, for the power and the grace of an almighty God. So in Jesus' name, fill us with your power, your spirit to God be the glory. Amen and amen.